So, welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. This week, we've got a special guest and a good friend joining me on the podcast. She's the founder of Thrive Global, and you probably know her as the co-founder and former editor-in-chief of the Huffington Post, Ariana Huffington. Welcome. It Thank is you so, so much. It's so exciting to have you on the program. Now, we're going to be discussing the importance of sleep, one of your favorite subjects. This is her best-selling book from the New York Times, Diet. And I also want to talk about your experience with the plant paradox and what success really means and who better to talk about success than you. I mean, you've been named Time Magazine's top 100 most influential people, and that's pretty important. You're on Forbes' most powerful women's list, and you've authored so many books, including The Sleep Revolution. And I must say, over the holidays, I read your book on Picasso, a uh, biography of Picasso, and Boy, I got to tell you, it changed my opinion of oh, him. Um, I even have an, an etching of his, and I, I, don't, I look at it in a totally different way now. <laughs> Maybe we'll get into that. So, uh, two years ago, or actually almost three now, you stepped away from your positions at AOL and the Huffington Post, and you mar launched Thrive Global. So, you're offering science-based solutions to try and end stress and burnout. Is that a good summary? Absolutely. So how the heck do you do all this? I mean, you're going to tell us that you can avoid stress and burnout with what you do? Well, what happens is that not that you can avoid stress, but you can avoid stress becoming cumulative until it becomes burnout. And uh, I actually reached that conclusion the hard way. I actually collapsed in 2007. Uh, two years into building the Huffington Post, uh, I was the divorced mother of two teenage daughters, and I had bought into the collective delusion that in order to succeed, you have to be always on, you don't have time to sleep, to take care of yourself, and I collapsed. I literally hit my head on my desk, broke my cheekbone, and that was the beginning of my studying all the latest science, because I'm a nerd like you, <laughs> and realizing that, in fact, all the new scientific findings make it clear that when you take care of yourself, your performance and productivity improve. It's not just your health that improves, but your cognitive performance improves. So I became more and more of an evangelist. I wrote a book called Thrive. And then, because everybody wanted to talk about sleep, I wrote a book about sleep. And two years ago, actually, I left the Huffington Post, which was a very hard decision because it was like a third child. And it was a global media company with my name on the door. But I felt that I wanted to spend 100% of the rest of my life helping people lead lives with less stress and avoiding burnout because, as you know, stress is so connected with disease and it is preventable. And that's really what Thrive does. It, it's both a media platform. Think of the Huffington Post without politics. <laughs> <laughs> it's and hard to separate. Those hard two. to separate. And also B2B, we go into companies and help them improve their cultures and see the return on investment, see the impact on productivity, on engagement, on attrition, on healthcare costs, etc. And then we've productized all that into behavior change micro steps. Because as you know, the reason New Year resolutions don't work is because Correct. they are so big and people do them maybe for a week, two weeks, and then they give up. So our um, behavior change um, prescriptions are all based on what we call micro steps too small to fail. Okay, so that's, uh, give me, so it's the new year, give me an example of a micro step that you can't fail at. Great, let's say that you want to reduce your addiction to your phone and to social media 
and to technology, which as you know, is a growing source of stress. Yes. Because we are all increasingly addicted to this thing and we find it hard to disconnect at night to go to sleep. 72% of people sleep with their phone by their bed. So if they wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or for whatever reason, they are tempted. Even if they tell themselves, I'm not going to look at my phone, if they can't immediately go back to sleep, they go to their phone. And that, again, all the science tells us is incredibly disruptive to getting deep sleep. So um, one of my favorite micro steps, and we have like over 700, is pick a time at the end of your day that you declare the end of your working day. It's an arbitrary end. Because the truth is that anybody who has an interesting job does not really have an end to their day. <laughs> I mean, you could spend all night, right, answering emails and handling things. Correct. I could do the same. Um, if anybody tells me, oh, I can do everything I could possibly have done by the end of the day, I say, mm, I think you should change jobs. Your job isn't interesting and challenging enough. <laughs> right? You're right, you're right. Yeah. So given that, we need to pick an arbitrary end to declare an end. And we declare the end by turning off our phone and charging it outside our bedroom. So that's a little step. It's a ritual, but it's very significant because you have a clear demarcation between your day life with all its challenges and problems and your night life, which should be all about recharging and reconnecting with a deeper part of ourselves. We've even produced a little um, product, which is a charging station that looks like a phone bed. <laughs> and um, it has a little blankie. It can charge up to 10 phones and iPads, so it could be for the whole family. And you're supposed to put your phone under the blankie, tuck it in, say goodnight, and reconnect in the morning. And you're fully recharged, both the phone and you. Perfect. Now, you know, my, my friend Dr. McCullough would say that the other reason not to have your phone by your bed is the uh, electromagnetic waves that are constantly coming out of your phone. Right. And disrupting uh, almost every, every cellular function that we have. And you're right, sleeping with a cell phone near your bed is a really dumb idea. And even if you turn it off, and you don't have to worry about the electromagnetic waves, it's still a reminder of everything you have to deal with in your life. Because our phone, it should never really be called a phone anymore. <laughs> the last thing we do on our phone is phone anybody. That's right. Um, it's really the repository of every challenge, every problem, every demand on your time and attention. And we need to disconnect from that. Is there, is there a time during the day that people should have a time out from a phone, like we used to have in kindergarten? We had, <laughs> we had to take a half an hour nap, whether we wanted to or not? Absolutely. First of all, at Thrive, for example, we all our meetings, you know, leadership meetings, product meetings, anything, are device-free. Because you know what happens at meetings. Uh, people claim to be taking notes. They are not. They're alleviating boredom. They're texting, they're um, updating their Facebooks, whatever. And we tell everybody, listen, if you have something more important to do, don't come to the meeting. If you're in the meeting, you need to be 100% in the meeting. And what's happened at the moment, our attention span has been dramatically reduced. I mean, it's now actually lower than that of the goldfish. <laughs> And so anytime we, there is a moment of boredom in the conversation, whether it's at, over dinner or in a meeting, we automatically go to our phone looking for stimulation. Uh, what were you saying? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So if no, we can you, stay present, then we are really going to be able to contribute. Right. So, you know, you're... Uh, you're a woman and you know, I have two girls and a wife and three female dogs. Uh, one of the things that I'm particularly 
empowered by. What do we do with teenage girls and young girls whose lives have suddenly become focused on their uh, phone and Facebook and Instagram and how they appear? It, how is how is Thrive going to help with all this? So here's what we are doing. First of all, that's such a major problem, and we have the data that mental health problems, especially among teenage girls, depression, anxiety, are skyrocketing. And it's a global problem. I just got back from China and India. That's right. Yes, we have, um, we have an office in Mumbai. Thrive is uh, doing a lot in India. Our biggest investor in our Series A was Jack Ma and Joe Tsai so from Alibaba. So we're doing a lot in China. and. The mental health problems among teenagers are a real epidemic right now. So what we are doing at Thrive is bringing them all the latest um, data, ancient wisdom, and new role models. Because people's minds and hearts are more likely to change through storytelling than data. So we bring them the latest science, but frankly, what moves the needle is bringing them people they admire, who are talking about why they are going on a digital detox, or why they are disconnecting from social media. We had Selena Gomez, for example, yeah. uh -huh. writing on Thrive about her digital detox and taking time off social media, and that moves the needle. In the same way that among business people, when I had Jeff Bezos write on Thrive why he sleeps for eight hours a night. Yeah. It went crazy viral. People could hardly believe it. But he had this whole analysis of how it improves his decision making. So you can give people the science. You can give them ancient wisdom, which is validated by modern science. But the stories we tell are what help convince people that there is another way to live and to work. Yeah, you know, I mean, our, all of our cultures are, are based on verbal sto storytelling. Uh, up until, you know, just a few thousand years ago, there you know, was no written word, there was no other way exactly. to communicate. And almost everything, uh, we're, we're hardwired to receive stories. And that's a brilliant idea. Um, there's a professor of neurology at, at Arizona, University of Arizona, and I'm, I'm blanking on her name, but she says that knowledge does not imply action. Mm. And so you can know what you're supposed to do, but actually doing that. So I think having somebody like yourself or Jeff Bezos say, if I don't get eight hours of sleep, I'm not going to be a good, you know, captain of industry. Yes. Um, just as He one actually example. analyzed and he said, if I get less sleep, my decisions, he said, are 5 to 20 percent less good. Hmm. And the future of Amazon depends on the quality of my decisions, not the quantity of my decisions. So um, we have a lot of um, people who are going to be listened to either in business or media or entertainment writing about what they are doing to take back control of their lives. Now, I approach this, uh, as you know, from the gut and food. And the longer I've been at this, the more impressed I am with the power of not only foods, but also the microbiome, the guts that live in our uh, gut, the bugs, to actually affect our anxiety and depression. And you know, I have some personal experiences with that with one of my children. And it, it is amazing, at least uh, in my humble opinion, the power of food, certain foods, uh, to absolutely make your brain crazy. Any, any mother of a four-year-old knows <laughs> that uh, you know, a trip to Disneyland with simple carbohydrates, uh, you get a uh, you know, hyperactive, child who suddenly then collapses screaming and crying and you can see just immediately the power of certain foods to affect brain function 
Have you, I'm sure Thrive is incorporating that into your Absolutely. plans. And we have incorporated um, the number one Gandhi rule, which is that uh, your health depends more on what you don't eat rather than what you eat. Because people may follow different prescriptions. I mean, they may be vegan, they may be meat eaters, but if they can stay away from sugar and simple carbohydrates and processed foods, that's already a big victory. And also, as you know, this uh, sleep movement and diet are incredibly interconnected. Like I have all the science in the sleep book that if you are sleep deprived, your body physiologically craves carbs and sugars. So it's not even a, a mental decision. <laughs> It's like physiological. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, years ago in my first book, Dr. Gundry's Diet of Evolution, I had a study of uh, actually college students who were put in a sleep lab and they were allowed to sleep for eight hours and then they were aw awakened. And they looked at a hormone that suppresses hunger uh, called leptin and the leptin level is nice and high. So they then took them and allowed them to only sleep six hours and their leptin level was very low, but the hunger hormone ghrelin went sky high. So then, so that actually proved, in fact, what we're talking about, that lack of sleep makes you hungry and it makes you hungry for simple carbohydrates. I learned that as a heart surgeon to stay awake all night. You know, I just eat simple carbs to stay awake. But the interesting thing is they took these same students, they told them that they were going to let them sleep for six hours, but they let them sleep for eight hours. Interestingly, they behaved as if they only had slept for six <laughs> hours. Their hunger hormone was sky high. So psychologically, they were prepared for a short sleep period. So amazing. Uh, it's amazing you know, the power of even anticipation of what's going to happen. Um, do you ever use an aura ring? You know, I, I love the aura ring and I used to use it, but now after um, all the work I've done on sleep, I'm kind of good on sleep. You don't need it anymore. <laughs> well, it's like I, I, I do get my eight hours 95% uh, of the time, like in all our lives, you know, something happens, there's a delayed flight yeah. or there is jet lag. Uh, but 95% of the time, it's my biggest priority. And I tell a lot of my friends, if they are trying to lose weight or um, get fit, and they wake up before they've gotten enough sleep to go to the gym, I said, no. Turn off the alarm and sleep. It's more important to get enough sleep. And enough sleep, as you know, varies, you know, 99% of people need seven to nine hours, you know, your number may be seven, somebody else may be nine, mine is eight, but there is one to one and a half percent of the population that has a genetic mutation and they don't need a lot of sleep. We know it if we have it, I know I don't have it. Uh, there are the people who wake up after four hours and they're feeling great and... yeah. Well, you know, Michael DeBakey, one of the most famous heart surgeons in the world, uh, only slept about four hours, and he lived into his late 90s uh, on four hours of sleep. The problem is the people who worked for him, if they thought that because Dr. DeBakey slept for four hours, they should too, that's the problem. And there are some people in positions of authority who have this genetic mutation and that's where we need to inform people. There is a test, as you know, there is a genetic test people yeah. can take if they're not sure. <laughs> but normally I think if you have any kind of awareness you should know if you have the genetic mutation or not. No, it's true. My, uh, my brother-in-law who's a cardiologist really wanted to be a heart surgeon but he knew that he could not go, you know, without the sleep that heart surgeons often do. And so he became a cardiologist so he could sleep more. And he's obviously much more intelligent than I am. So, 
But yeah, I could. Uh, I, the longest I ever went without sleep, uh, seriously, was 72 hours on call in my residency program, and then I went for. And then I slept for four hours, mm. and actually went to see an orchid show. It's a true story. Now, looking back, um, you know, we most residents before the rules of how long a resident could stay in the hospital, we were so sleep deprived and made quite frankly, bad decisions. Um, but, you know, our our mentors had done that and doggone it, right. if they were going to do it, um, you had to. You would do it. But we, we've done a lot on the Thrive Media platform about uh, doctor burnout. As you know, it's a real crisis. Yes. And the increase in doctor suicides. And we had a great surgeon from Cedar sinai who wrote a very powerful piece um, about his own experience and the changes that have to happen. So we are trying to put a spotlight on this crisis in the same way we're trying to put a spotlight on the crisis you mentioned among teenagers. And we've launched a program of um, mental health on campus. We have at the moment uh, Thrive editors in over 70 universities huh? working with students um, writing about what's happening because as you know a lot of colleges don't have enough mental health facilities or um, the ability to provide the help that students need which often is incredibly simple um, just the right foods the right sleep and movement can deal with an enormous amount of mental health problems we're not talking about you know, bipolar disorders or schizophrenia. We're talking about garden variety, depression and anxiety. And they are so connected to what we eat, how much we sleep, and are we moving? And those three things are the things that really are lacking in, you know, in most colleges. Plus, uh, most of us were away from our parents for the first time and often extended different distances and you don't have the, the family unit yes. to kind of pull you back together. Uh, so are, in campuses, you know, can you get units, uh, sort of thrive forming communities in campuses where? That's what we're trying to do, to form communities, to, to give people um, a platform where they can share their problems, where they can support each other, and to also offer them Knowledge and micro steps. I love what you said. Knowledge is not enough. Yeah, and fortunately it's not. I mean, I have my Apple Watch. You know, you can, it can tell you a lot of things and it's going to be able to tell you more and more things. It can tell you your heart rate variability, your blood pressure. But if it doesn't tell you, so what can I do? That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly you right. You know, so my blood pressure is high. What do I do? Do I go to emergency? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was just to chill out, uh, go to bed. <laughs> Maybe it should do that. I don't know. Actually, this crazy thing says, you know, you, this morning it says, you should try to go to sleep between 7.45 and 9 o'clock tonight. And I, you know, I, I'm looking at my phone going, 7.45? You know, <laughs> I'd love to do that, but I'm actually probably going to be driving back from Gundry MD up to Santa Barbara <laughs> about that time. But you know, the watch is actually right. You know, the, the ring says, yes. that's what you should do. And, you know, in the good old days, and it wasn't that long ago, we slept with, the, with sunlight. You know, when the sun went down, time to give it up. And when the sun got up, it's time to give it up. And I try to learn from my dogs. You know, dogs, when the sun goes down, they start looking at you like, hey, you know, let's get to bed. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, when the sun comes up at, you know, 4.30, you know, one of my dogs is on my face saying, time to get up, sun's up. But even, speaking of sleep, up until the light bulb uh, was invented, our source of light was candlelight or gas lamps, which have a lot of red and yellow spectrum light, which actually is very calming and sleep-inducing. Now, we have very white light which has a lot of blue light in it and most of our devices are blue light and as you and I know blue light is what keeps us awake and I think one of our struggles with sleep in the modern era is we're just constantly bombarded 
with blue light. It's on our TVs, it's on our phones. That's why it's so important to disconnect from screens um, and, and leave yourself a little time for a transition to sleep. Um, in The Sleep Revolution, I write about what we do with our babies. You know, we don't just drop them in bed. We lower the lights, we give them a bath, we sing them a lullaby, uh, we prepare them to disconnect from the world. We, we read them Good Night Moon, which is a very psychologically profound book, mm -hmm. disconnecting from every item of your room and your world. I actually recorded on Audible a parody called Good Night Smartphone. <laughs> Because we need to help ourselves have a transition. I get a transition to sleep. I try to make it 30 minutes before I'm going to turn off the lights. But even if it ends up being 10 minutes, I like to have a hot bath or a hot shower, which is, which is really like a ritual cleansing away of the day. Mm -hmm. And um, wear dedicated sleep clothes. I used to sleep in the same clothes I went to the gym in, not literally the ones I wore that day. but. <laughs> You know, the same t-shirt and sweatpants. Yeah. And then in bed, I only read physical books. And books that have nothing to do with work. You know, reading poetry, philosophy, novels. And all those things prepare our brains to go to sleep. Because it's not our bodies that need preparation. Our bodies are exhausted by the time we get into bed. But if our brains are going, 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 we need to slow them down. So what I'm getting from you is uh, I'm going to call Penny, my wife, and so I want her to give me a bath <laughs> and sing me a lullaby before yes, I go to bed every night. Is exactly. that a good idea? Well, you don't need your wife to do it now. You can do it for her. Oh, no, I think <laughs> Okay, okay. That, that's a great idea. Tell Penny, I'm coming tonight, and I'm going to prepare you for bed. I'm going to get you for bed, and then you can get into bed and Read Rumi or your favorite poet together. All right. I'm, I'm going to pet my dog or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're, you know, you are the epitome of the powerful, successful woman. What, what does success mean to you? Do you have any Well, in, uh, in Thrive, the book I wrote before the sleep revolution, I try to redefine success because um, success in modern life has been reduced down to these two metrics of money and power slash status. And I feel this is an incredibly shrunken definition of success. So I wanted to expand it to include what I called the third metric, which includes well-being, our health. You know, if you don't have your health, it doesn't matter how much money or how much power you have, you know, your life is so diminished. Um, wisdom, you know, how can you tap into the wisdom we all carry in us, but so often we're disconnected from? The third part of the third metric is wonder. You know, life is so filled with wonder, whether it's nature or um, the goodness of human beings or music or anything that we are drawn to. And so often we are so distracted that we miss it. I mean, I remember when I started changing the way I worked and lived, walking down the streets of New York in Soho, where I live, as you know. And um, for the first time, I actually looked around, as opposed to being on my phone or texting <laughs> while walking. And I was with a friend, and I remember saying to her, this building is so beautiful. When did it go up? And she said, 1930. <laughs> and, you know, I wonder, what else have I missed? And the final part of the third metric is giving. You know, a full life includes giving. Um, whatever form it takes. Um, it doesn't have to be financial giving. It can be giving of yourself. It can be having personal connections with people that we normally tend to have in personal transactional connections with, whether it's the barista in the coffee shop or the, um, the person who cleans our office. 
And so I think that's what creates what the Greek philosophers call the good life. So that's success. That's success. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you an interesting story that I, I talk about in my next book, The Longevity Paradox. Um, that when I was a, during college and in medical school, I was a scrub tech, a scrub nurse in an inner city hospital in Atlanta called Grady Memorial. And I worked the night shift. And uh, we had a, a black gentleman who, who mopped the floors. And he always had an unlit cigar. And he always had a giant smile on his face. And he was always singing as he mopped the floor, humming. And one day I said, I stopped in the middle of the night. And I said, you know, you are so happy. And you know, here's a menial job. I said, why are you so happy? And he says, are you kidding? I have the best job in the world. And I'm you know, looking at him like, really? And he says, you guys, you doctors, and you nurses, and you techs have to see to do the operation. And to see, you have to have good light. And you see, if I don't get these floors mopped clean, there's not enough light reflecting off the floor. Oh. So my job mm -hmm. is the most important job for you to do what you do well. And when, if I don't keep these floors clean, you guys can't save lives. And that mm. was great success and great happiness. And it stayed with me ever since. And I actually write about it in the next book. That's amazing yeah. because it was really, he had found meaning in his job. Exactly. You know, and, and he was right. And, you know, and that's why he was singing all the time and happy. Mm. And so, yeah, you're right. The, we got to find meaning and that's, yes. that's success. I, I agree with you. So similar thing. Why are so many people afraid about failing? Every, you know, nobody wants to fail anymore. I know. Well, I was very like to have a mother who would have loved you and you would have loved her. Um, she drummed into my sister and me the fact that failure was part of life. There was no, there's nobody who has succeeded, who has not failed along the way. We could do an entire podcast on my failures. Mine. And so she used to say, you know, failure is not the opposite of success. Failure is a stepping stone to success. So she kind of made us be willing to take risks because if you're not willing to fail, you're not going to take risks. And anything interesting in life has no guarantees. Uh, true. Yeah, it's very true. And so um, I feel very lucky that she gave us unconditional loving, meaning her love wasn't conditioned on whether we succeeded or failed. And that was like a foundation for us to aim for whatever we wanted to try and do. So she didn't say, you only got an A, and why didn't yes. you get an A plus? Exactly. No, she would come home from school with our grades, with flowers for both of us, no matter what we got. No matter what? Yeah, because she knew we were making an effort. Mm -hmm. So, you know, effort, it's like, it's not like if we're lazy or not working. But her love was not just conditioned on whether we got the A. And you see now, we talked about teenage girls and mental health problems. We see so much pressure being put on them to excel, to get into an Ivy League college. Or Again, none of that is, is really what determines a good life, even a successful life in a broader sense of success. So what do you tell like a tiger mom, just to use an example, that maybe this, you know, getting your kid into the best, best kindergarten and, you know, they better have straight A's and, you know, they better have SAT scores off the top or they're failures. How, how do we help this current? Trend? Well, actually, I love Amy Chua who wrote The Tiger Mom. When my book Thrive came out, she actually invited me. She's a Yale law professor. And um, she invited me to Yale, and she and I did a conversation called Striving versus Thriving. Yeah. And, uh, and we talked about that. And my argument to the ultimate tiger mob was that, you look at the data. It's not working. It's like it drives kids to major problems and to lacking um, the self-confidence which is so key to 
achieving things and trying for things. And so I think we need to look at the data of what pushing our children too hard is doing. You know, the overscheduled child that goes from violin class to um, an additional reading class and another um, preparation for SATs, et cetera, et cetera. And what for? Yeah, I mean, nobody has a time to be a kid anymore, as far as I can tell. And, you know, that need for playfulness, which is part of our own need as adults, too, to ability to play, um, to ability to enjoy life uh, no matter what, because there is no life that doesn't include challenges, is something that you learn as a child. So at Thrive, do you, do you have play time? <laughs> I mean, can, uh, here at Gundry MD, I mean, we have gym, we have dogs. Um, is there playtime schedule? Yes, we have, um, first of all, we have um, our cultural values. And one of them is relentlessly prioritize and get comfortable with incompletions. Because if you are not comfortable with incompletions, you are never going to have that arbitrary end to the day, which always includes incompletions. During the day, we have um, free mas you know, massages, chair massages, yeah. um, healthy food that we bring in. Um, we have um, our own workshops that we provide for companies. We also provide for our own um, employees. And I think one of the things that one of my favorites is uh, Whenever we hire somebody, part of the onboarding is what we call the entry interview. You know, everybody does exit interviews. <laughs> we do entry interviews. And the first question is, what's important to you outside of work? And how can we support you? And our chief content officer, for example, said, what's important to me is to be able to make my therapy appointment every Tuesday you know, at seven o'clock, whatever it is, it's not, it's a very reasonable <laughs> request. And, you know, she had not been able in her previous job to, to, to go for, on time, forever. Hmm. So we, she found in the company, an account, what we call an accountability body. And the accountability body is responsible for getting her out of the office by six so she can make her appointment at the other end of town by seven. Huh. Literally, you know, she could take her things and put them by the elevator. <laughs> so <laughs> you are leaving, leaving now. And I feel this is just a small example of how you can support each other at work, not just in terms of what you are doing for work, but what you are doing to actually make your life healthier and more effective as a result. And then it also creates real bonds among coworkers. So Thrive uh, now is teaching companies how, how to do this, right? Yes. Because you mentioned earlier, and I totally agree, that you know, work, um, if you don't have healthy employees, everything falls apart. Um, the, the days lost from illness in this country, the insurance costs are really what we're killing companies. You may have great people, but if they're not yes. doing well. So give me an example. How do you come in to a company and affect change? So we come into a company and we have a lot of multinational companies like Accenture, JP Morgan, Nestle, the Hilton Hotels. and. Um, we do pro workshops, which can be half day, day long, two day, leadership work, workshops, executive workshops, call center employees. You know, at every level, we work with them to reduce stress. And one of my favorites is the call centers. <laughs> because a lot of companies have terrible problems with attrition among call center employees. And as you know, attrition is very expensive. Yeah. So, but they told us, 
Uh, listen, we need you to fix our problem on call center employees, but you can't take a lot of their time because they're because hourly they employees. <laughs> so we created these minute interventions. As you know, because you're a scientist, it takes less than 60 seconds to course correct from stress. So um, we know through machine learning when a call center employee has gotten a particularly nasty, stressful call, from a customer yeah. and the next call is a Thrive call that in under one minute tells them, uh, we now want you to stop and remember three things you are grateful for. Or we want you to stop and stand and stretch and we guide them through a stretch sequence. We want you to stop and breathe consciously. Inhale and exhale for 45 seconds. And these simple interventions have a game-changing impact because, as we said at the beginning, you're not going to eliminate stress. What we can prevent categorically is stress becoming cumulative until we get home <laughs> and we can't go to sleep because we're so wired and our cortisol levels are up or we have to self-medicate to bring ourselves down. So instead, we're going to have a hot bath and a then hot bath, and a lullaby. A lullaby, um, yeah. light a candle, whatever works for you. So tell me about your experience with the plant paradox. So I loved reading the plant paradox and practicing it uh, because it rang so true. And then um, I saw how good I felt when I avoided, you know, the simple carbohydrates, the processed foods, um, the meats that were not grass-fed. And I love the sort of how deep you go into this distinction between really grass-fed and quote-unquote organic. <laughs> which, you know, may mean simply that um, the chickens or um, the cows have been fed corn or all the things that actually are not what our bodies need. So um, it's been um, really great. And I love that I can eat good cheeses, since that's my weakness. <laughs> um, I, I can give up sugar. <clears throat> but a good Swiss cheese or good um, cheese that's not processed and, and found already pre-wrapped and everything. Yeah. Um, just changes the way you feel and uh, your energy and how you wake up. Well, and I haven't seen you in a couple of months now, and you look fantastic. Thank you, and, and thank uh, you. So I think you've made, and you make it also science-based, which I love, and, um, and simple to practice. We're going to go to the audience question now. Uh, <coughs> Bethy Butterfly, at Dr. Stephen Gundry. Can you help me clear something up? I'm having a debate with some folks about this. Oh, I love debates. Uh, elderberry syrup for the flu, is this compliant? That's a good question. So, um, elderberry can actually um, be useful, but it's actually useful because of the polyphenols in it. So you don't actually need the syrup. You can even take bilberry or elderberry capsules and eliminate all the <coughs> sugar that's in the syrup. But I'll give you a better tip. Vitamin D, you've heard me say this before, is incredibly antiviral. And you need to take a large dose of vitamin D when you feel a cold or flu coming on. Uh, I personally take 150,000 international units a day for three days. That's about a half a million international units. If you feel squeamish about that, try 50,000 three days in a row. The University of California at San Diego has shown that 40,000 units a day, every day, cannot produce vitamin D toxicity. So please don't be afraid of vi high dose vitamin D3. Uh, that's the best way to break the flu, if you catch it early. Second question she has, what about veggie juices? 
Here's the problem. The really good stuff in vegetables is in the pulp. And when you juice a vegetable, you're throwing <coughs> the pulp away. What I'd much rather you do is get yourself a magic bullet, a Blendtec, a Vitamix, a Ninja, a Nutribullet, and blend your entire vegetables. That's in all my recipes. Make a smoothie out of it. If you are going to juice, believe it or not, throw the juice away, take the pulp, and put it in what you're going to prepare. In fact, I'm going to have a book coming out in the fall on how to do this. So where can people find you and Thrive? So Thrive is thriveglobal.com and also on every social medium, Ariana Huff with 2F on my Instagram and Thrive, um, Thrive's Instagram. And what we love is to invite you all to contribute and share your stories. We have um, over 35,000 contributors. Wow people who write about their own experiences and you never know who is going to read it and be influenced and be helped by it. To make it super easy, I'm going to give you my email address and you can email me directly, ah at thriveglobal.com and then we give you a password and you can post whenever you want and we social all the good things and that's how we create a thriving community. But you're not allowed to do this in the middle of the night, right? Not at all. Not in the middle of the night. You have to sleep and recharge in the middle of the night. That's it for today. Ariana, I can't thank you enough thank for joining us. Thank you so us. much. Thank you. And thank you for being such a proponent of the plant paradox. I love plant paradox. And thank you for writing it and for spreading the word. And thank you for spreading the word. So. This is Dr. Gundry. We'll see you next time, and I'm always looking out for you.